Welcome to Zion Lutheran Church, Plumas, Manitoba, a congregation of Lutheran Church Canada. Here is our pastor with Sunday's homily. Faith, hope, and joy fill your hearts and your believing. Amen. One of our theologians in the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, suggested that all four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, are passion narratives with long introductions. Now, whether you agree or disagree with this assessment, you cannot deny that all four Gospels in the New Testament culminate in the passion of Jesus, in his death, burial, and glorious resurrection from the dead. This is especially true for the Gospel according to St. John. Last week, I said that every chapter in the Gospel of St. John is either directly or indirectly related to the Passion. I mean, half of his Gospel is devoted to the events of Holy Week itself, from Palm Sunday to Easter Sunday. And so for this reason, I would agree with our theologian from the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. All four Gospels are Passion narratives with long introductions. And that obviously begs the question I posed last week. When does the introduction to the Passion cease? And when does the Passion itself begin? The woodcut we pondered last week displayed Jesus washing his disciples' feet on Monday, Thursday, the night Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper. And you could suggest that the Passion of Jesus began here when he washed the disciples' feet. But on the other hand, Palm Sunday is also known as the Sunday of the Passion. And others would suggest that the Passion of Jesus began when he entered into Jerusalem in order to suffer and die on the cross for our sins and rise again from the dead for our eternal life. And still others would suggest that the Passion of our Lord Jesus Christ began with his agony in the Garden of Gethsemane. The woodcut scene we consider tonight. Perhaps it was for this reason that Mel Gibson's film, The Passion of the Christ, began with Jesus' agony in the Garden of Gethsemane. The image of the Garden of Gethsemane is closely associated with another scene woodcut in Durr's Small Passion that we will not consider for our midweek Lenten devotion. Following his title page, The Man of Sorrows, that we did look at on Ash Wednesday, the very first woodcut scene after The Man of Sorrows is Adam and Eve in the Garden of Paradise, and their fall into sin and death, which consequently spreads to all of humanity. In the words of C.S. Lewis, we are all sons of Adam and all daughters of Eve, and therefore all of humanity now lives with this dreaded disease of death and sin. But the second Adam, Jesus Christ our Lord, took on human flesh in order to enter this world of death and sin, to defeat this horrible thing of death and sin by his death on the cross and his glorious resurrection from the dead. Jesus is the promised seed of the woman, the one who would crush the serpent's head, even though his heel would be struck to the wood of the cross in order to forgive the sin and death of all of humanity, and release them from death by his resurrection from the dead. For this reason, Durr depicts Jesus in agony in the Garden of Gethsemane. And Jesus is in the center of the scene, if you notice. That's because Jesus is at the center of God's plan of eternal salvation. It is through his death and resurrection that we are forgiven and have eternal life. And this salvation of God is accomplished in Jesus' suffering and agony, which began in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus knows that his cross is near, that he will die on the cross for the sin of the world. He knew what lay ahead. Just look at the details in the woodcut scene. Notice all the emotions and images that Durr carves into the woodcut. You can see Jesus suffering, pain, and agony. 
Notice how the woodcut is shrouded in darkness around Jesus. It's as if there is this halo of darkness that surrounds Jesus in agony. And you can see in his body physically how he is in agony. Notice how Jesus is kneeling in prayer with his hands tightly clutched, begging his father to find some other way to forgive the sin of the world, but humbly and obediently submitting to the Father's divine will to death on the cross by crucifixion. You can even see Jesus' foot curled up, shown in a tight death grip of fear and dread of the cross, so as then to communicate how his sweat became like great drops of blood falling to the ground, according to Luke. 22 verse 44. In the top left hand corner of the woodcut scene, Durr reveals an angel descended from heaven to strengthen Jesus. In a white cloud of glory, the angel brings Jesus his cross so that Jesus could complete his divine mission according to the Father's will. Jesus would indeed drink the cup of sin and poison to its dregs and suffer and die on the cross for you, for me, and for all of humanity, so that we might be forgiven, so that we might be cleansed and purified by his blood shed on the cross and have eternal life through his resurrection from the dead. Beneath the cross, in the bottom left and right, are Jesus' three executive apostles, Peter, James, and John, his dearest friends, the ones we met last week when we saw them in a triangular formation when Jesus washed his disciples' feet. The three executive apostles, Peter, James, and John, had also witnessed his glorious transfiguration on Mount Tabor, but now they are slumbering and sleeping while Jesus suffers in agony and pain while he battles the tempter. Peter is seen in the bottom left-hand corner slumbering and sleeping. We know it's Peter because he holds his sword in his hand, ready to strike the ear of the servant of the high priest, to which Jesus would heal that servant's ear. Another disciple to the right bows his head on his knee in sleep and grief, while behind his back is a third disciple, and he looks up to Jesus and the angel. It's difficult to make out, but he's there. Holy Scripture teaches us that all three apostles slept. And yet Albert Durer depicts this third disciple awake with his upturned face intensely watching Jesus in his agony and pain. And we assume this one looking up at Jesus is the Apostle John, the one who never left Jesus' side, even when Jesus was nailed to the cross for the sin of the world. Far, far in a distance at the top right-hand corner of the image, you can barely make out the enemies of Jesus. They're now leaving Jerusalem with their clubs and swords and flaming torches, ready to arrest Jesus and bring him before Annas and Caiaphas and later Pontius Pilate. There is no doubt that the passion of Jesus has begun. And we have to remember that all this took place late on Monday, Thursday. After celebrating the Passover feast and instituting the Lord's Supper, Jesus and his disciples walked to the Garden of Gethsemane, to the foot of the Mount of Olives, which is less than a mile away from Jerusalem. The garden had a grove there of olive trees, and that garden was called Gethsemane, which means oil press. In fact, they are still olive trees growing there, producing fruit right from the time of Christ. It was here in the darkness of Gethsemane that Jesus faced the fiercest temptation in human history. It was a temptation that had grown from its conception in the Garden of Eden. Jesus, the Messiah, is the promised seed of the woman, born of the Virgin Mary. He is the Savior. 
He is the perfect Adam, the second Adam, the one who came to do battle with Satan once and for all. And so through the lenses of Durr's woodcut, we see vividly the humanity of Jesus Christ. While he remains fully God, without confusion, division, separation, or mingling these two natures, Jesus suffers great agony of body and soul, knowing that his time has come to suffer, to die, to be beaten, whipped, and flogged, and crucified on the cross for our sins and the sin of the world. Not for anything he had done wrong, but for what humanity has done wrong. As Jesus suffers, bleeds, and dies on the cross, he atones, forgives the sin of the world and our sin. It's hard to imagine the immeasurable gracious love of God in Jesus Christ. I don't think words can really describe it. How God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son Jesus in love, not to condemn the world, but to save the world through his death on the cross for every single human being all the sons of Adam and all the daughters of Eve until the end of time. The eternal love of God in Jesus Christ is for you and it's for all of humanity. It is universal. It is for all people of all times and of all places. And that's why I love how St. John put it in his first epistle. Jesus is the atoning sacrifice for our sins and the sins of the entire world. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus is consumed with anxiety and dread. Death and life are locked in mortal combat, struggle and temptation. Jesus knows his cross. He knows that he must suffer and die to atone for the sin of the world. And therefore, he places himself into his Father's hands. Not my will be done, but yours. In perfect love and obedience to his Father's will, Jesus crushes the serpent's head for us. The promise that came in the Garden of Eden is about to be fulfilled as Jesus knows what will happen in the Garden of Gethsemane. His suffering, passion, and cross will indeed atone for our sins in the sin of the world. But as for you and me, we thank our Lord Christ that he knows all our woes, all our sufferings, all our pains, our fears and anxieties. In a lot of ways, we cannot identify with Jesus because no one will know what Jesus experienced as he took upon the sin of the world. But in a lot of ways, we can identify with these three executive apostles who do not keep watch with Jesus for but one hour. Where Jesus, the eternal Son of God, is victorious in his temptation, he overcomes Satan, the old evil foe, and he dies our death on the cross. We do not overcome Satan, our sinful passions of the flesh, or the lure from the world. We fall into temptation. On our own, we have absolutely no strength to survive the schemes and lives of the devil, the world, and our own sinful nature. But Jesus knows our every woes, our weaknesses, our struggles, our pains, our human flesh. Because in every way, Jesus was tempted as we are, yet he was without sin. And therefore, Jesus invites us to bring all our woes, all our weaknesses, sufferings, pains, fears, anxieties, and troubles to him in prayer. Jesus hears the prayers we pray in his name, and he promises to be with you and grant you courage and strength that comes through the very place where he promises to be in word and sacraments. And the blood of Jesus shed on the cross speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. It cries to God the Father for your forgiveness so that when you do fall into temptation, you will have the love of Christ, his forgiveness, in order to carry on in this life of death and sin. And when we leave this valley of death and sorrows, 
We also have the promise of everlasting life and the resurrection of our bodies because Jesus overcame death and the grave by his glorious resurrection from the dead and opened the way of everlasting life for you and all who believe in him. So in the words of Paul Gerhardt's hymn, Why should cross and trial grieve me? Christ is near with his cheer. Never will he leave me. Who can rob me of the heavens? That God's Son for me won when his life was given. In the name of Jesus, amen. Now the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom be glory forever and ever, and unto the ages of ages. Amen. You can find and follow Zion Lutheran Church Plumas on Facebook under Zion Lutheran or on our open Facebook page called Zion's Sermons. Please like, share, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thank you for watching.